Hey there, fellow data and analytics aficionados, and thank you for joining me today for the episode of Caserta's Data Intelligence Webinar Series, and I'm your host, Remy Rosenbaum. Today, we're going to explore the topic of on-prem innovations in the modern data warehouse in the Microsoft stack. So today, it's going to be all about if your organization is not ready to fully embrace the cloud, and that's not a problem. And with so much focus on cloud today, a lot of times it's easy to overlook some of your battle-hardened technology and skills that you may already have in-house. And the Microsoft data management ecosystem has continued to evolve and improve, and better yet, it provides a unique pathway for moving to the cloud when you're ready. So today we're gonna to show you how to put the tried and true lessons of an on-prem data warehousing into practice using the stack. And building a data warehouse is really a key first step to leveraging that data that exists throughout your company. Um, and uh, the uh, SQL, uh, SQL Service Integration Services really provides a solid foundation. It pulls all of your data into a single location and it understands the relationships that exist among the different facets of your business. And to explore this topic, today we have an excellent presenter, DJ Nemkovsky, who is an ETL architect at Caserta and who himself has architected many data warehouses for Caserta clients. Uh, more than that, DJ has more than 30 years of experience in data warehousing and has developed solutions of all kinds and sizes for a wide variety of companies. He is an expert in Microsoft SQL Server and SQL Server Integration Services. So first, just a bit of housekeeping and we'll get started. Caserta, if you don't already know, is a professional services firm laser focused on data and analytics engagement. We deliver strategic assessments with actionable roadmaps. We validate your assumptions and different technologies. And then we also craft innovative designs and architectures. And ultimately, we perform advanced implementations that leverage the latest technologies and proven frameworks and our methodologies. Our teams are all led by data scientists and data engineers who share a relentless dedication to solving our clients' data and analytics challenges fast. And if you'd like to hear more about it, you are very encouraged to ask me and I'll uh, uh, put you in touch with some of our very happy clients. So our data analytics expert webinar series like today is designed to give you insight into the hottest technological trends and issues that we're working on. And after today's webinar, I really do encourage you to speak with us about any questions you might have and how we can apply what you learned today at your organization. After the webinar, we'll send you a recording to the email address you provided. And if you have any questions throughout the presentation, please enter them in the questions panel on the right, and we will answer them during the live Q&A session at the end of the webinar. DJ, all yours. Hey, thanks, Remy. Uh, looking for the screen control here. I'm not sure if I had, there we go. Should be coming through. There you go, you should have it now. All right, uh, yep, looks good. Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is DJ Nemkovsky, as Remy said. Uh, as you will no doubt discover quickly, I think, I am really not a professional presenter. Uh, so I plan to approach this kind of like I assume the Jamaican bobsled, bobsled team must have approached their task. I don't expect to win a medal. I'm just trying not to flip the sled and kill myself. So that said, I'm going to try and walk you through at a high level why you want a data warehouse, why SQL Server is a good choice, why you'd want to automate the entire process and what the, in the individual tasks involved would look like. So this is a page designed to make me look uh, smart. Uh, when Microsoft originally brought the code for SQL Server from Sybase, I was lucky enough to be the database guy at a case tool vendor, for those of you who remember what case tools were. Uh, that provided the impetus to learn SQL Server so it could become a supported uh, platform. Uh, it's been an interesting journey since then, from the initial 4.0 releases when Microsoft was getting their feet wet to the 6.0 realization of, dear God, it does what? Uh, which morphed into the emergency rewrite labeled 6.5, uh, to the complete teardown and restructuring of 7.0, which introduced auto-tuning as well as DTS. Now, auto-tuning was and continues to be a great feature. DTS, however, was way too complicated for broad ETL usage, but it made up for it by being extremely slow. Uh, to the 2005 release, which introduced SSIS, which is what we're gonna talk about today a good bit, to the mature releases that we're seeing today. I've used SQL Server to implement data warehouses for banking, insurance, healthcare, hedge funds, bond trading, real estate, telecommunications, TV, manufacturing, and a whole bunch of other stuff that we can't list here. 
it's really suitable for any kind of an environment that you might be uh, operating in or find yourself having need to, uh, to code for. Okay, these are the topics that we're gonna cover. It's really not going to, uh, to, to wind up being very far ranging. Uh, what is the under, uh, underlying importance of data warehousing? Why using SQL Server is a good basis? What are the benefits of automating your ETL? And what steps you should take to automate your ETL? So, okay, this is just a, a cheesy photo of, uh, of a data warehouse. It's a simple picture of what a data warehouse is trying to do, but in practice, it's not that simple. Many organizations build data lakes rather than true data warehouses because the construction's easier. A, a data lake is just a simple copy of tables from disparate sources into a central repository. And I've worked on way too many of those to enumerate them here. Uh, it very, it's very similar in appearance to a data warehouse, except that not a lot is done to try and transform the data. And as a matter of fact, nothing is done. It's just schlepped down. Uh, the, the, the nightmare with data lakes is reporting. You can get different answers to the same question depending upon which data elements you choose as a source. Something simple like a customer listing could be generated differently by two different processes, one using the customer database as source and the other using tables from the orders database as source. Now, all that said, data lakes can be a good intermediate landing area for data on its way to a data warehouse, sort of using it as a staging space. That helps you limit the load on the source systems to a single hit and allows those systems to get back to what it is that they want to do on a regular basis so that you can take off and do the data warehousing aspect of it that you want to do. You just don't want the data lake to be the end of the road. Okay. How to decide what's critical to know. Now, <laughs> This is where I, I have actually kind of a break. Having access to a guy like Doug Laney, who knows how to look at data for strategic advantage is awesome. Companies are largely good at identifying how their business is currently conducted, but deeper looks can identify relationships, measures, and trends that exist. Bringing your data together is critical for being able to take advantage of those opportunities. You also have to identify the system of truth for data elements deciding which version of an element, element which is kept in multiple systems will be considered to be the correct one. Using the same example, we'd probably wanna take customer data for the data warehouse from the customer database rather than from orders, or at the very least, customer's first, order's second. Uh, then uh, the, the question, once, once you determine where your system of truth is, becomes how do you relate customers from your CRM system, sorry, to uh, your order system? Where's the commonality that says customer one, two, three in, in your CRM system is the same as customer XYZ in your operating system? So doing these critical architecture steps incorrectly is why many uh, data warehouse projects end in failure. So the physical architecture also has to, for how to store these elements, also has to be designed carefully. And then how to map the disparate data elements from all of these into the constructs that you've uh, selected for your data warehouse is the last task that you have to do. So as, as I said in the beginning, it looks simple in practice, but uh, or simple in picture, but in practice, it's actually uh, a good bit more involved than that picture lets on. Okay, so that said, let's go into why uh, Microsoft SQL Server is a, uh, a good choice for, for how you would uh, go about implementing this. Okay, being scalable, and not just to huge databases, but also to small ones, it's an essential flexibility. I've worked with organizations that barely had 100,000 transaction rows total over several years of business because they're, high, they're uh, low volume, high yield kinds of organization, uh, organizations, excuse me. Now, another organization that I was working with uh, at Bank of America specifically, they were bringing in 450 million transaction rows every day in their risk operation. So SQL Server is an, ex is an excellent choice because it can handle either one of these environments 
seamlessly without uh, having to retrain your entire staff. Uh, clustering in SQL Server is the process of using multiple servers to ensure that your data is always available. You can do that in a simple active-passive methodology where you've got the live server sitting in one bank, one uh, machine, and the backup server waiting for a failure from the primary to happen so that it can take over. Uh, you can also do uh, NX uh, implementations where you might have, uh, say, three or four different servers uh, with maybe seven or eight different databases spread across them, each one of them acting as a backup for the other. You might do it that way if the machines are too big to, uh, to uh, allow for uh, extra machines sitting there for, for large applications, and you can tolerate momentary uh, slowdowns when uh, failovers happen and you have to try and figure out how to get yourself back on your primary node. Replication. Replication is the process of distributing copies of your data across multiple servers. This is done to share the application or reporting load, thereby increasing performance. Uh, using BOA as an example again, we had, I think, 12 different uh, servers that were sitting in a variety of different locations, some of them in the US, some of them in EMEA, some of them in Asia. Uh, Distributing data in this way allows local control for how the data is being consumed. Uh, if one region has application needs that are not shared with other regions, then they have their own copy of the data and they don't have to bother anybody else about it. You can uh, also streamline your applications then to have them only be installed where they're going to be needed. Okay, uh, SQL Server comes with an onboard job scheduler, SQL Server agent. Having a highly configurable job scheduler is a huge plus. Not having to allocate budget and people to a central job scheduler saves on complication as well. Lastly, it operates seamlessly with, a, uh, with uh, Active Directory networking, which is pretty much what most of the world is using now in terms of their base networking system. Uh, integrating permissions with Active Directory provides ease of use and heightened security because you're, uh, you're not handing user IDs and passwords all over the place, either encrypted or not, uh, to, uh, to, to be able to uh, so secure permissions for your applications. It's, it's definitely a much more secure method for, for going about uh, uh, provisioning users for your systems. Next is uh, SQL Server Integration Services. Uh, it provides a graphic representation of ETL functions, which provides visual clarity for what is being done. Now, the, uh, the picture that I've included here is an actual SSIS screen uh, that's been executed. That's what some of those counts are. But it's very easy to follow. You've got source data that's occurring at the top. You have a conditional split based on some set of configurable parameters that are inside. And then in this particular construct, we're splitting the data out four different ways. Data for the United Kingdom is coming here. Data for the United States is coming here. Germany here. And by uh, acclamation, I guess everything else is spilling into the default bucket. So you can graphically get an, Im uh, an image of what your ETL is trying to do just from the picture without even having to crack open the construct and seeing what's going on underneath, both in configuration and code, you can get a basic idea for what's going on. Okay, uh, wide ranging functionality is a must. Speaking about the full suite of programming functionality, there are common constructs like data flows, which this is, and SQL tasks, but they can be augmented with processing loops, sequence containers, external executables of you know just uh, programs that you have that uh, that you can use at, at a given point in time, script processing, FTP, uh, command prompt executions, and dozens of other available options. You can do all kinds of stuff inside here. It's 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 got a full suite of programmability available to it. Uh, highly configurable. Being configurable is essential to processing flexibility. You, uh, in the, the case here, uh, the data source 
uh, is, is probably configured so that uh, from a portability standpoint, you don't have to change the code when you move from development to test to production. You just change the parameter that's being passed in and the, uh, the, the construct works exactly as it does in all the other environments. Uh, and you can pass uh, parameters into and out of different kinds of constructs. Uh, you might have a, a case where you don't know what you're going to want to do until you know what the data is going to look like. So you're processing the data, say, to get to the United Kingdom down here. And uh, when uh, you uh, arrive at that point, you now have an idea of what it is that you want to do with the data based on looking at it, and you can take multiple paths from that point. So the, uh, the, the parameterization of, of this is also uh, providing flexibility to you. And lastly, as with SQL Server, it operates seamlessly with AD networking. They're both Microsoft products, they're both SQL Server products, and their, their method of using AD networking is the same. Okay, now we're going to get into why you might want to automate the ETL. Uh, the first is accuracy of data delivery, removing execution variance. The accuracy is ensured by removing operator error from the equation. You get the same execution every time your jobs are run without having to rely on operations personnel remembering the sequence of jobs that they have to execute. Uh, this is uh, largely incorporated, you know, it's actually completely incorporated by uh, implementation of metadata, and we're going to talk about that at length in a little bit. But uh, removing those, uh, the variance of uh, what happens when an operator runs job six before he runs job four, uh, and you know the problems that can be caused by that uh, are just removed by uh, structuring it in an automated fashion. Okay, operational ease. It's parameter driven. Parameterization provides for flexibility as time advances or needs change. You can pass the date that you're processing in or change the execution sequences by altering parameters rather than by changing code. So you try and write your code in a way that's flexible so that it can be uh, swapped in and out. Uh, making it as atomic as is possible is usually a good rule of thumb there so that you can structure things uh, to, uh, to, to only do the one task that they need to do and uh, that, that allows you the flexibility to swap it into and out of whatever it is that you need for it to be doing. Identifiable triggering, which is the second point there, uh, ensures that jobs only run them when they're supposed to and as soon as they can. And that's the important part of that. Uh, a common tactic in data warehousing is starting ETL based on time. Now, this is a pretty clumsy way of going about it. It leads to pushing execution times to the worst case scenario, which has the effect of shortening your processing window and getting data to users later than you might. If you use triggering, uh, the, if you, by using triggering, the ETL process starts as soon as it possibly can. And by executing a batch sooner, you can also expedite downstream processing that is waiting for what has just been triggered. And uh, the last point here is preset sequencing, which ensures that tasks needed by subsequent tasks are run first. When you firmly control when jobs run, you never get the question about why a user is not seeing the customer that he knows he just added yesterday. If the customer information is supposed to be there, it is. And this is something that, uh, that I'm a big believer in, auto retry. <clears throat> uh, night, nighttime operations staff have a, a real problem with, uh, with retrying uh, tasks in a lot of instances. Run books have to be maintained religiously and can become kind of complicated. So I try and set up auto retry with the stuff that I'm doing. Uh, it's parameterized, once again, for flexibility. You know, uh, there are two basic ways that you might go about this. A retry can be done quickly to resolve for momentary, momentary kinds of problems. Uh, a good example of that is a network blip. Your process was trying to connect to database server A, and there was a huge network job running that was taking all kinds of bandwidth, and it prevented your connection from going through, so your process failed. If you've got auto retry with a short stroke on it for time, like say five or 10 minutes, it gives that network uh, crunch time to clear, 
the process can restart itself again and uh, has a, a chance to run without anybody having to touch it or pay much attention to it at all. Uh, a longer stroke can be uh, can be set for deeper issues where something is truly wrong with the data. Uh, somebody uh, from the upstream portion of uh, the operation that's passing data into your system changed uh, some sort of uh, uh, formatting in one of the uh, the input files that they're passing you, and it caused your process to fail. Those take some time, and you know if you're going to try and use auto retry with an issue like that, you probably want to have that be longer. You can run these in combinations, and you can uh, configure them for however many retries you want: one, two, five, twenty-eight, doesn't matter. You can uh, it's configurable, and you can do what it is that you want to do with it. Okay, this brings us down to the, the, the last part of it, the, the meat and taters of it, if you will, which is the, uh, the automation of the ETL itself. So I uh, mentioned earlier that we were gonna talk about metadata and this is where. Uh, defining your triggering and sequencing is done via metadata. So if, for when you're, you're, you're talking about sequencing, you can do that in a variety of different ways. Most of the places that I've ever been uh, do all jobs in a single batch on one trigger because their their operation is pretty straightforward. They get all their data at one time and they just want to plow it into the data warehouse and get it over with. Perfectly valid way of doing it, easy to set up, and you only have to set up one trigger this way. A more complicated way, uh, we did this uh, just in time uh, where completed batches uh, trigger subsequent batches. That was uh, what we did again at Bank of America is a very good example. They uh, had a worldwide operation going with risk where information was coming in from Japan first uh, and the Far East, Asia, then the EMEA kicked in and they were running, uh, finally passing control over to the Western Hemisphere at the end of uh, the, the day and then starting right back up with uh, Asia the next day. So once the, uh, the jobs from Asia came and dumped all of their data, if you had purely reporting jobs that only cared about Asia data, they were available to go at that point, and that's the way we structured it. We made small batches of Asia input and then small batches of Asia output and had them triggering each other. You can also use the old standby, triggering by time of day, do a setting up scheduling uh, and uh, I'm sorry, sequencing and triggering via metadata doesn't prevent you from having the trigger fired off by a specific time of the day. And if you don't want to do any of that, and you just want to do manual triggering because you want your, uh, your operations to be tightly controlled to when someone says that it's appropriate to do something, you can do that too uh, with this system without having to do anything special. Automation of ETL. The first thing is model job. Uh, I can't say this enough. Uh, it's very important that you have a standard model. Now, I chose Wiley Coyote to, uh, to, to represent this because while all of his misadventures had different details, you know, dynamite was involved, anvils flying into cliffs, running over by trucks, all of that stuff happened, but the base model was the same. You started with Wiley himself, and I can't stress this enough for uh, for doing your ETL system. Uh, the model job that you use, that you have, I'm sorry, uh, will be the basis for all ETL jobs, as well as the automation job that we're going to talk about in a little bit. It'll contain all standard elements, such as logging, error handling, and basic flow. And using the model job ensures that all jobs have a common footprint, and that helps with maintenance and troubleshooting. If the basic structure of all jobs are identical with only the central processing as, as being the different, basically any member of your development staff can take a look at any problem that you're having or any module that needs maintenance and already know 30 to 35 percent of what it's trying to do because they know what the basic structure is supposed to look like. So it definitely saves you on maintenance. Okay, the, the, the basic components that you need. Obviously, you need logging. 
There are two different kinds of logging that I advocate for. One is technical. It's uh, generated by SSIS. It provides total insight into which tasks were performed and in what sequence. This is very useful when you're trying to trace why a specific result may have occurred. If you look at that log and you see that steps one, two, three, and seven ran, you might wonder why four, five, and six didn't run, and maybe that's an indication of what your problem is. So it gives you a very good place to start. Process logging is a little bit more involved. Uh, it's controlled by developers implementing what is desired by local convention. Now, some of the process logging is done by the basic flow of the model job. Excuse me a moment. I needed a little water there. <clears throat> you know, things like when a job started, the parameter names and the values pass with them, whether a job was successful or failed, what caused the failure, and when it finished. Those are all done by the model. Everything else is at the discretion of your development staff. Commonly log elements are basically like row counts and things of that nature, but anything else that you consider informational and helpful can be put in the process log and made available. Process logs are very nice for producing wrap-up reports. Error handling is also set up and it's, in, it's important for troubleshooting problems that have occurred. You need complete and clearly articulated log messages that describe the error condition. And in, additionally, you need to send an email out uh, to alerting whomever is that needs to know that an error has occurred. Uh, all of this is uh, configurable as well in terms of uh, whether or not you want error messages and who needs to know if you did. Brings us to the automation job. This is key, it's the heartbeat of what we're talking about. It uses the model job as a base to ensure that all the pre-programmed elements are present and consistent. It gets its triggering and sequence elements from the metadata definitions that we talked about earlier. It uses these de definitions to, to determine if something needs to be run and how that execution should be handled, what sequence it should put them in, what should call what based on what. And finally, it needs to send an email at the end for the batch status denoting success or failure, along with a report about what those jobs did. Simple things like, you know, it started at six, it ended at 7.30, it ran for an hour and a half, that sort of thing. And, Here's our friend auto retry again, and it's the same basic stuff that I was talking about before. Uh, it can be quick, it can be longer, it just depends upon what it is that you want to do and how you want to, uh, to configure the whole thing. So that's all folks, you can tell I'm a Warner Brothers cartoon kind of a fan. Uh, we talked about the importance of data warehousing why SQL Server was a good choice, why you wanted to automate, and the steps that uh, you might take to automate something. Which brings us to Q&A, where we can ask things like, where are my keys? What's the capital of Peru? Or if we wanted to, maybe something a little bit more on topic might be appropriate. So uh, at this point, I guess I need to pass control back to Remy who uh, I think is gonna, gonna take care of uh, proctoring this portion of it. Thank you, and uh, I will take it back. Um, so first of all, thank you very much, DJ. That was very insightful. Um, and uh, I'd like to now open the floor to any questions that uh, people may have. Uh, you can enter them into the questions panel on the right. We have time for, I think, uh, a couple. Um, so the first question is, DJ. What are some tactics you can recommend to use for dealing with data formats that change over time? Uh, I'm gonna sound like a broken record here. I am a huge fan of metadata. Uh, so if you think that you're going to be in a situation where volatility is going to be an issue, uh, I would say that uh, instantiating metadata with uh, the nature of what it is that you want to do, and then uh, using that metadata to construct queries in a dynamic sense 
is a good way to go about it because if you're uh, if you're going to uh, have to to change something, uh, it's much easier to just change the metadata to reflect what it is that you want to do uh, rather than having to go in and change hard coded constructs. Uh, the one thing, uh, what was I thinking about? Uh, I had a second point there, but I lost it. Sorry about that. At any rate, the uh, the, the the metadata. Oh, I know what it is. Uh, you, it's not just a matter sometimes of uh, of uh, just putting you know this input that output. Sometimes you have to provide code in your metadata uh, as an override to simple copy statements uh, and uh, God, what was the other part of that? I guess I keep losing that fact. Anyway, uh, it, it's it's just a little bit uh, it's a little bit more complex to set it up that way, but it definitely will be flexible and uh, it will actually run relatively well as well. We set something like that up at, uh, or we're going to set something like that up at Bank of China uh, before uh, the pandemic hit. So. Uh, you know, the, it, it, we, we did a, uh, uh, a prototype there, you know, proving that it worked for them. And I've used that same uh, technique in a, a variety of other places as well. All right, thank you. Um, on to our next one. This is a single source of truth question. <clears throat> I'm the data guy at a small business. How can I convince my boss this will increase revenue? We're experiencing the issue of different numbers depending on where things are being pulled. It's a mess. Yeah, I have been where you're living right now. It drives you crazy, uh, especially if you've got a finance guy who it sounds like you do, who is uh, you know, making you justify everything on a cost basis. What I used, where was I, uh, when I was at uh, Market Access uh, was the argument of different answers for different question, or I'm sorry, to the same question, depending upon uh, what you use as a source. Uh, there were people there who had pet answers that they wanted because it supported what they wanted to do with their department, truth be damned. So uh, you need to, to breed that out. And it also uh, uh, breeds out nomenclature issues where one guy refers to it as silver and the other guy says it's off gray or you know whatever the 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 the, uh, the nomenclature issues are at your company choosing a single source gets everybody to also settle on a single nomenclature because you're going to copy it in the same place we're all going to call it the same thing so you have to i think push the idea of everybody singing from the same songbook uh it will result in some people being unhappy with you be ready for that uh, because you're 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 taking their toys away from them, but uh, it does definitely get the basis on a more solid or the business on a, a more solid footing. All right, thank you. And uh, here's our last question: uh, As ETL tries to ingest new data into the data warehouse, perhaps via new partitions, how would it impact concurrency or locking in the data warehouse? Users may be querying data while ETL is trying to bring in new data. Yeah, that is always the issue. I think uh, a lot of people try and resolve some of their uh, their issues from the reporting side by having the uh, the reports use no lock as a, a hint in SQL Server. Uh, I can't stress this enough. Don't do that. It's a bad idea, and it will lead you to places you don't want to go. Uh, it 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 is definitely difficult uh, to uh, to try and uh, operate in that environment. Partitioning, as you alluded to in your, your question, is a, a very good way of going about that if you can tolerate the number of partitions that you might need uh, on an ongoing basis for, uh, for the data. If you've got to keep 15 years online for what you're doing and you've got a partition for every day, that becomes unwieldy. And you also have to make sure that your queries take the partition key into account for every query that they write. So there's a little recoding uh, wrapped around having to do that. Uh, uh, if you are adding data only to the end of your data warehouse, a lot of those problems take care of themselves. If you've got a, uh, 
a revisionist view of history going on on a daily basis where rows that have been written into the data warehouse historically are being changed on an, uh, an ongoing basis. That's where the, the, the kind of concurrency issues that you, uh, you talk about really come into play. And uh, I've not found a good blanket way of, of trying to handle that particular problem. I'd be, uh, you know, I'd be happy to, uh, to, to, to try and kick that around if we wanted to, uh, to come up with a, uh, a, a more defined uh, uh, description of what it is that you've got going on where you're, where you're at currently and, and maybe uh, think about different ways that that might be, uh, might be overcome. All right. Thank you, DJ. And that's all the time we have for today. But if anyone has other questions about uh, data warehousing, building data warehouses, strategy, architecture, and implementation, please send me an email. We would love to have DJ answer your questions. Uh, and also, the recording will be sent to the email address you provided. Uh, again, thank you for coming. And DJ, thank you for the insightful presentation. You're very welcome. Take care.